Oh, hi everyone, my name is Ian McCullough. I'm a senior here at Emory and I'm dual majoring in NBB as well as Anthro Human Bio. And my plant was uh, Digitalis purpurea and it's a member of the Plantagenaceae family and it's commonly known as Purple Foxglove. It's been used medically mostly in England for over 700 years now, but its use was inconsistent and very anecdotal. Like it would get picked up in one place, used for a while, and then the use would be disregarded, and then it would pop up again. Um, until 1785, when it was characterized by a physician, right, when its use was characterized by a physician named William Withering. And he really wrote down the dosing, uh, how to use it, as well as uh, the indications for its use. And the predominant use was uh, dropsy, dropsy, which is uh, known as congestive heart failure today. Uh, its bioactive constituents are still widely used as pharmaceutical agents. In fact, they're the fifth most commonly prescribed drug in the country uh, at this point, which is frankly amazing considering uh, what such an, how it has such a narrow therapeutic window. Um, Digitalis purpurea is a herbaceous biennial, meaning that it has a two-year growth cycle. Uh, so if it's planted from seed, uh, the first year it's going to grow nothing but foliage, and then on the second year it'll flower, seed, and then die. Uh, it's known for its uh, conspicuous purple flower, and the uh, flower was actually characterized by Fuchs in 1600, and that's where it got its uh, scientific name from. Uh, Digitalis purpurea directly translates to purple fingers. Um, it grows to a height of one to two meters, and it typically grows in uh, temperate climate. It's native to north, uh, excuse me, uh, north um, Africa, Europe, and Western Asia. And however, after its pharmaceutical use was character characterized by withering, it was widely imported to the United States and North America where it was used medicinally for a while, and then it was used uh, basically just uh, as a plant. It's uh, such a lovely flower. It was planted widely in gardens, and now it's really proliferated in the United States as well. And again, this is uh, William Withering over on the side, the physician who first characterized its use. And as I said, he characterized the dosing criteria for Digitalis purpurea in uh, 1785. And it was originally used um, in teas. The leaves were boiled in a tea, and that was used to treat patients suffering from uh, dropsy. Now, when we get into the chemistry of this plant, that's uh, really where it gets interesting. Uh, the predominant uh, phytochemical agent in Digitalis purpurea, as well as uh, all of the Digitalis species, are the cardiac glycosides. And there are three, three major glycosides that have been used uh, in humans throughout the use of digitalis. Uh, the first is digoxin, uh, the second is digitoxin, and the third one we'll get to on the next slide. Uh, but these are the two major ones that are still in use today. Uh, digoxin is the most widely used of the pharmaceutical um, glycosides just due, because it has a shorter half-life and it's able to be secreted or, or excreted by the kidneys, which enables it to uh, clear from the body faster. Digitoxin is also used, but it's used in cases of renal insufficiency when a patient has kidney failure and they wouldn't be able to secrete digitalis. So digitalis can build up to toxic levels in patients uh, who have kidney issues. The third cardiac glycoside is uh, gitaloxin. And this is the only water-soluble glycoside that's found in appreciable quantities in digitalis or in digitalis purpurea. So people think that this is what was causing the effect uh, from Witherington's foxglove tea, because when you boil the plant, this is the only one that comes out into water. The other ones, uh, digoxin and digitoxin, have to be extracted chemically, and that technique wasn't developed until a few centuries later. Uh, as I have on my slide, there are no current therapeutic uses for uh, gitaloxin, uh, predominantly because there are no real, there are really no CAM uses for digitalis. Um, I think that's due to its um, stereotype as being very toxic, uh, but it's currently not widely used in CAM. Okay, the predominant pathology that the cardiac glycosides are used to treat is congestive heart failure. And congestive heart failure happens either following a heart attack or following prolonged hypertension when the heart has to work excessively and it just becomes weaker and can't pump blood throughout the body. 
the body tries to compensate for this lack of perfusion by increasing blood pressure, which just exacerbates the problem because now the heart has to pump against more resistance and it can't do that as effectively, so blood flow decreases even further. And when the body starts to uh, lose perfusion, it shunts blood away from the kidneys and it, that doesn't allow the body to secrete fluid as urine, which results in uh, just a buildup of fluid in the peripheral tissues. And as the condition advances, the blood flow builds up in the lungs and results in difficulty breathing and eventually death if not treated. Okay, now uh, the deeper perio derived glycosides work in two direct ways, and those direct ways influence the body in a few indirect ways. Uh, the first is, or the first direct way, is the inhibition of the transmembrane uh, sodium potassium exchanger, which I won't get into, but the mechanism is over here on the slide and is in my PowerPoint if anyone's interested. And the second way is by increasing parasympathetic tone. Now, by in inhibiting the sodium potassium exchanger, um, it allows a, strong, a stronger heartbeat, and by inhibiting or by potentiating parasympathetic tone, it creates a slower heartbeat, which results in more blood flow going to the heart itself, more blood supply to the heart, and as in more blood supply to perfuse the heart, and also more myocardial or more um, ventricular filling time. So, because more blood enters the heart in between beats, more blood flow can be pumped out of it. So this increase in blood ejected from the heart increases tissue perfusion, which uh, results in a decrease in the pathological hypertension, and it also increases systemic perfusion as well as perfusion of the kidneys. And because you're now perfusing the kidneys, more fluid can be excreted as urine. And that's the indirect mechanism, is uh, this increase in blood flow to the kidneys, which results in uh, fluid excretion. Okay, and here's another example of the mechanism. I will uh, just mention real quick, or briefly, that the way it acts is by inhibiting the sodium potassium exchanger, and this results in a buildup of sodium inside the cell. And the way the sodium calcium exchanger works is uh, calcium is pumped out of the cell as sodium is pumped into the cell. And cal this pump derives its energy from the sodium concentration gradient. When there's a lot of sodium outside the cell but not much inside of it, sodium wants to enter the cell. And when sodium enters the cell, it forces calcium out. But if there's no concentration difference between sodium inside the cell and outside the cell, there's no energy to drive that pump. So the concentration of calcium builds up inside, which results in uh, more interaction between the contractile proteins in muscle cells. And this increased interaction results in more force every time the heart beats. Okay, uh, Withering, again, he keeps popping up, but he was the first to really conduct clinical studies of this plant. Uh, he tested different doses and really, uh, really figured out the uh, accurate therapeutic dose for the plant. And as is, as we note today, he ultimately achieved a success rate of about 80%, which is what current cardiac glycoside therapies have as a success rate. So if you go into, or if you have a family member who needs treatment with either digitalis or digoxin today, and they start taking it, there's gonna be about an 80% chance they'll respond appropriately, um, about a 5% chance that they won't respond at all, and then about a 15% chance that they'll develop drug toxicity before they can develop a therapeutic response. So with all the modern research techniques we have and with all the uh, new techniques for extracting these compounds, we really haven't been able to beat withering success rate in the 1700s. Um, again, in the early 1900s, we identified the mechanism of action for the plant-derived glycosides and Lately, we've, or as in since 1990 to present, we've uh, studied the effectiveness of it. And, <clears throat> excuse me. Or at least the effectiveness of it as compared to other drugs. And it's uh, still one of the most potent inotropic agents out there. And it has been shown to reduce uh, hospitalization and reduce mortality compared to other inotropic agents or compared to a lack of inotropic therapy at all. Okay, uh, again, it's for the management of congestive heart failure. Digoxin and digitoxin are the two most widely prescribed medications for allopathic use. And there are some reports that it's used in CAM. However, those are anecdotal and sporadic. And 
it's widely thought that it's not used in CAM because of its uh, the stigma of toxicity associated with it. Like it was used as a poison in history or traditional folklore. The most common reason for toxicity or for uh, lack of effectiveness is this narrow, th narrow therapeutic window. And again, it's, a, it's essentially a poison if it's used in too high of a dose. And the dose necessary to receive a benefit from it is about 70% of the toxic dose in most patients. And that dose varies widely from patient to patient. So a patient may receive or may have a toxic level or may have toxic levels build up to the point where they die at a dose that would be subtherapeutic for another patient. So it takes a lot of time for a cardiologist to work with each patient and dial in the correct dose and slowly increase it or slowly decrease it to where they're getting an effective therapy, but not they don't have these toxic side effects. And the two, or one of the main reasons for that is the extended half-life. Uh, digoxin has a half-life of 36 to 48 hours, depending on the patient, and digitoxin has a half-life of about 10 days, which that's the longest of almost all drugs that are out there that are currently used. The final um, dosing issue is that digoxin is secreted by the kidneys. So if you have a patient that starts developing renal failure while on digitalis therapy or a patient that has it and just doesn't tell their doctor about it, then the half-life of digoxin goes up to the 10-day half-life of digitoxin because it can't be excreted by the kidneys. So if the doctor doesn't know that and prescribes a standard dose of digitalis, they're going to develop toxicity within a few days because their body just isn't getting rid of it. Uh, the only drug that's really uh, directly uh, contraindicated is furosemide, and it can be used, but again, you have to maintain uh, a watch over that because it'll change electrolyte concentrations, and uh, when you change these electrolyte concentrations, you really influence the mechanism of digoxin, and the, you can result in a lot of the symptoms that we have. Uh, the side effects and symptoms are um, nausea and vomiting. Uh, they can include uh, heart palpitations, uh, bradydysrhythmias, tachydysrhythmias, which are um, either a pathologically fast heart rate or a pathologically slow heart rate. Um, if toxic concentrations increase, then you'll get what's called atrial fibrillation, where the heart just kind of, or ventricular fibrillation, where the heart just kind of flutters and doesn't pump blood effectively, and that's what usually leads to death from uh, digitalis. Again, it's uh, one of the oldest and most uh, potent cardiac inotropes out there. Well, it is the oldest inotrope, and it's still the most effective. And after all the work we've done with modern, modern pharmacology, we still can't beat withering success rate from 200, almost 300 years ago at this point. More research is being done into how to manage it and concurrent therapies that can be used with it to increase the effectiveness and reduce toxicity, but those studies have not yet been published or the results have not yet been published. Okay, does anybody have any questions? <clears throat>